Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Yes, it is time for for a Sunday School Bonanza brought to you by This Week in Mormons. Uh, bringing some more Gospel Doctrine prep to you. Hope it'll be useful for you to, to attack Sunday with a little bit more... I almost said zeal, but I don't know if zeal would be... Eh, you know. We're joined, of course, again by Brad Lammy. Glad to be back, Jeff. Here he is. Happy to have you. Thank you for joining us. Man, we are we are almost done with the year here. We only have a handful of lessons more after this one. And then we will have done the entire Book of Mormon for all these lessons. I know, oh, it's crazy. I can't believe how much time has passed. It's incredible. I know. Almost a whole year's worth. And this is Lesson 43. It's called, How Could Ye Have Departed from the Ways of the Lord? Now, we're getting right here, starting with Mormon Chapter 1 through the Book of Mormon, a lot of the Book of Mormon within the Book of Mormon, not to be confused. It's very meta, but that's okay. Uh, a lot of stuff happens here. It's most of Mormon's account of being there, leading the army. Uh, and a lot of the fall of the Nephite nation is witnessed very briefly in these chapters, but it's been prophesied for a very long time. So we can't say we're surprised, but uh, I think Brad's going to kick us off this week. Well, uh, <laughs> thanks, Jeff. Uh, one of the things I, I really appreciated was the uh, first the attention activity. Um, and oh, the question dears. is asked, if you were sailing a boat, what equipment would you want to have? I want it to have a sail. I'm a sailor. Um, yes. I sail. Maybe some water. Yeah, some other good stuff. Um, and the next question is asked: um, In what ways are people who do not follow the Savior quote as vessels without sail or anchor? And so, as we're discussing the this lesson, um, you're going to notice that theme come up. Uh, what what happens uh, when those who do not uh, have an anchor in the Lord, and you don't listen or ha- follow this, the wind or the uh, the spirit. And uh, anyways, um, when Mormon was uh, very young, he uh, was given the responsibility of uh, the sacred records. And the question is asked, how old was Mormon when he was given responsibility for sacred records? We know that he was a young age. Um, later, we hear that he was 15 years old when he uh, was visited of the Lord and tasted and knew the goodness of Jesus. And there are a couple of ways that we can know the goodness of the Savior. Um, I, I think the, the expression, no, I visited of the Lord and tasted and knew his goodness. Um, each of us, when we go through times in life, uh, whether we, we repent or we... Um, fill a greater portion of his love because we go through trying times we get a taste of the atonement and we get to know of his goodness and that you receive his strength and we know that mormon received some of that yet um you know that that is just uh, some of the things we can receive for the goodness of the savior um, but we know also in chapter one that amaron instructs uh he meets uh, Mormon meets Amron and instructs Mormon to do certain things with the plates. And there are certain characteristics that Amron mentioned to young Mormon that um, allowed him to be prepared to preserve and abridge the sacred records. And what are those characteristics they, they talk about there? They talk about him being a sober-minded. And, um, and I thought about that, sober-minded. What is you know, For me, I think sober, I think of not... You, not uh, drinking. However, sure. <laughs> uh, culturally speaking, that's like, oh, it's sober-minded. Oh, he doesn't drink. No, but here it's actually being being wise, um, thoughtful, contemplative, and that he, as it had a he noticed a, a discerning spirit among among Mormon. And um, another part that finds very interesting is that uh, as Mormon is given this commission to possess and preserve and abridge the records, mm-hmm. the Lord forbids him. And they have the questions asked, why did the Lord forbid Mormon to preach to the Nephites? And in Mormon chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, it reads, And I did endeavor to preach to this people, but my mouth was shut. And I was forbidden that I should preach unto them, for behold, they had willfully rebelled against their God. And their beloved disciples were taken away out of the land because of their iniquity. But I did remain among them, but I was forbidden to preach unto them because of the hardness of their hearts. And, the, and because of the hardness of their hearts, the land was cursed for their sake. I think that brings up a very important point. Is that you know many times that we may 
encounter both individuals we know through through work or through family um, who where we don't feel we should talk about the gospel to not because we're trying to withhold it from them but the spirit says you know maybe you need to not be preachy yeah, yeah or maybe you need to just listen and the lord sometimes may give us that instruction as he gave to mormon because there, there's more things that are going on here and it's important to recognize that if you are willing to say and speak the gospel to somebody, but you feel constrained from the spirit, it's important to listen why. And that's something that's a very important lesson that we learn that Mormon has to has to learn as he is tries to teach, uh, to teach the people. He's he's forbidden to. And what is the reason why it says there? It says because of the hardness of their hearts. So sometimes we think that if I were just to pre, you know. When you think of uh, in the scriptures, oh, that where I were an angel, I can preach the gospel to anyone I wanted to. Well, that's wonderful, but the Lord does not. He wants you to preach to people who are ready, and sometimes when you're when you're not ready, that's fine. But when he tells you no, listen. It's an important lesson for Mormon, and Mormon did great things. I think the key here is to is to know what the Lord wants you to do, and follow His Spirit. Yeah. Absolutely. And this, well, gosh, this guides Mormon so much because later on, as this young man, he is called to be the leader of the Nephite armies. And this is both because of Mormon's greatness, and I can probably imagine because of the Nephites' wickedness, there is no one else to really fill that role because they're so just bad at this point. And, uh, and, this is the, and think of these conditions that they're in. You know, obviously, this fulfills the words of countless prophets uh, earlier in the Book of Mormon. The Nephites would be so wicked, as you were describing, Brad, that they're just kind of they're just they're way beyond the pole at this point. They're, you can't you can't even reach them anymore, no matter what he does. But he, I think, reluctantly, even in his wisdom and youth, agrees to lead them, hoping for better things, because he still loves his people. And how often do we, I think, feel despair for our loved ones and our people, and yet we still feel the responsibility uh, to fight for them and to lead them and do what we can for them? I mean, I picture very much a parent who sorrow who experiences sorrow for an iniquitous child who is still there in every way they can be for that child, but is also powerless to necessarily help that person become better. And there becomes a point when the Nephites have been, they're fighting a lot, they're, they're being decimated quite a bit, they're struggling, and he sees the people mourning. And at first Mormon rejoices because he sees them in mourning. Because the first thing he's thinking, like we've seen all throughout the Book of Mormon, is that they are being brought down, they are, they are being humble, and the pride cycle will right itself and the people will eventually... They're coming around. But then as rejoicing, he realizes is in vain because the people were just, they were, they were sorrowing as it says. Actually, I'm going to read this in Corinthians if it pops up here. You'll love this. So it says, Now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow work with repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Um, just the way I described that, the sorrowing of the damned effectively. And that's what this is dealing with here, not the sorrowing unto repentance. And that really is, I feel like that's a moment when you would feel such a sense of loss and desperation uh, for these people you are trying to serve. Because even their sorrow is not even the correct kind of sorrow. Uh, to, this is not you know broken hearts and contrite spirits that we've talked about many times. Brad? What I find interesting is that what's the difference between in sorrow and repentance and sorrowing to the damned? It is one thing who or what you turn to when you are placed in a position where you sorrow. Do you turn to the Lord or do you turn to the things that are not of him? And many times, you know, there's also a point beyond that. You don't just, you have to, you don't, not just one or two options, turn to the Lord or things that are not of him. It's, mm-hmm. do you turn to the Lord? Do you turn to things that are not of him or do you turn and rebel? Because you turn to things that aren't the Lord, that at least there's some give. There's some way to move to the, to the Lord. Yeah. But whereas you, your sorrow of the damned, it is, it is an outward rebellion. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the sad thing that you see, is that people, you know, the Benefites knew or had a knowledge of a lot of the restored, uh, restored truths and chose not just turn, turn away from, turn from the side of the Lord, but completely against him. Yeah. And, and his ways of, of finding that peace. So, and so what I what I personally learn a lot from in this account of Mormon 
is that he still personally loves his people and wants to serve them despite their complete unwillingness to even recognize the Lord's hand. I mean, they go on to defeat the Lamanites in battle, but they don't recognize it's the Lord. And the only solace they even have, you can see in Mormon 2.19, a Mormon says at the end that he, he sorrows in his heart because of their wickedness. He says, Never, nevertheless, I know that I shall be lifted up at the last day. His only solace isn't even for the hope of his people. It's that at least he knows that his station and his status with the Lord is at least secure. And that's, it's sad, but I admire Mormon so much for sticking it out and for loving his people. And after about 30 years of le- leaving, uh, leaving, leading them, uh, he finally refuses to lead them because all they wanted, they're bloodthirsty. They just want to seek revenge on the Lamanites. The spirit of the Lord has completely ceased to be with them. And, and they're effectively a lost cause at this point, which is really sad because the pride cycle has gone in circles throughout the Book of Mormon. But this is the point when it just turns south. And it never recovers. And the Nephites will slowly and we'll finish off learning about the great battle. Uh, but we can move on here real quick, talking about some of the records that he's given. Purposes of the records. What is the purpose of the records that he has abridged? You started off talking about Amaron gave him these records. What? Why? What is he supposed to do with these? Why does it matter? You know, it's it, a bit redundant. I, I, I think there are both within the Book of Mormon and also from the uh, modern prophets. We, we know some of those things. Uh, the reasons why um, within the Book of Mormon we, we see that one is that that you may know that you must stand before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged of your works, as well as that you may believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Also, to provide a witness that Jesus is the very Christ mm-hmm. and the very God, and to pers- persuade all ends of the earth to repent. There are also other reasons that both to show as a type to people in our day the process in which a people who once knew and loved the Lord can and have or have turned away from him and to watch those pitfalls by by helping um, it, by reading the book of mormon and understanding and discerning both the enemies of Christ as as well as how paralleled our times are to situations that are featured in the Book of Mormon, both with the, uh, the people of Jared, as well as the Nephites and Lamanites. And as you understand that process and, and, and try to help through the Spirit and through learning and, and the combination discern those parallels and to overcome those things and, or to warn or to repent. And, you know, to come into Christ or there is one or one reason as many other reasons, but also to point out the enemies of Christ and how we need to turn to him and, and what will happen if we don't, because in the end, because uh, the restored gospel in, 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 in this case in the Americas is not, uh, is tied to the righteousness of the people. Right. And that's something to pay attention to. It very much is. And then after all of this, we go to the final battle, all but 24 of the Nephites are killed. And, that's tragic, but I think one of the most interesting things is there There are clearly lots of records in the Hill Shim, and Mormon hides them in the Hill Cumorah, but specifically the smaller, like, it's we. It's funny, he takes these records and hides them, and of course there's the one record that he's been keeping, this compendium, that he passes on to Moroni. Uh, all the rest of the records, you know, we don't know if they're hiding out somewhere, and we could get into Book of Mormon debates if it's Central America or if it's somewhere in upstate New York, if there's another hill somewhere that is hiding all of the other stuff. But... He recognizes the importance of keeping these records because the the Nephites at this point are a fallen people. There's 24 of them left. They are fallen, even in this complete desperation. Could you imagine being a large civilization and then after all of these battles, you're one of the remaining 24 people. How could you not stand up and say, guys, maybe we're doing something wrong here? Because we've seen through the records that our forebearers also struggled, but when they turned to the Lord, they were preserved. And they're so steeped in iniquity and in pride that they just say, well, what's up? It's 24 of us now. We're just going to keep going headlong, straight into battle. We don't need, we don't need God. We don't need any of these things. Um, it is a tragic uh, lesson here, I think, but a lot of great stuff that we can learn. We're about out of time with it right now. But um, One of the last things I would like to kind of read from before we conclude, Jeff, sure. is the, there's, uh, in the end of the lesson, we, it, there's a, a bullet point that's important to mention. It says, we, live, we also live in much wickedness today. How, how can individual righteousness make a difference in an unrighteous society? Uh, Elder Neil A. Maxwell warned, 
only reform and self-restraint, institutional and individual, can finally rescue society. Only a sufficient number of sin-resistant souls can change the marketplace. As church members, we should do our part of that sin-resistant counterculture. And that's the truth. Good, good note to go out on. I mean, it has to come from the individual, and it has to come from us as a body of saints. You know, we can't, we can't think it's going to come from any other source. You and I were talking about this a little bit before we started this episode. You know, there are a lot of great things, whatever you believe in politically, but at the end of the day, everything comes down to us and our understanding of the gospel and how we choose to live it and help other people come unto Christ and improve their lives as well. That's really the only answer in the long run. And, and the importance of not having the spirit of contention and how that no. can be a, a, a way that's distracting from the things of the Lord. Absolutely. Well, this has been uh, Sunday School Bonanza. Uh, please find us, of course, at thisweekinmormons.com. Go to facebook.com slash thisweekinmormons at the real twim on Twitter. Find us on YouTube. We're all over the place. Brad, thanks for joining us. Glad to be here again, I enjoy Jeff. your pithy insights. <laughs> Well, I'm glad to be a part of this. It's, uh, it's helped me understand the gospel a little better. That's kind so. of fun, right? So this has been lesson number 43 from the Book of Mormon Manual. How could ye have departed from the ways of the Lord? Sunday School Bonanza, wishing you a good and productive Sunday. Bye-bye.